Hi, and welcome to the CDO Magazine interview series. I'm Chris Ner, Chief Digital Officer of Synity, a world leader in enterprise data software, and we're partnering with CDO Magazine, MIT CDO IQ, and the International Society of Chief Data Officers to bring you this series of interviews with thought leaders in data and analytics. I have the great pleasure today of talking with Danielle Krupp, Chief Data Officer at American Express, and a CDO Magazine 2020 Global Data Power Woman, selected by CDO Magazine for being a pioneer and a key influencer in shaping the data and analytics industry. Welcome, Danielle. Great to have you on the, uh, on the podcast and, uh, and terrific to meet you. Thanks for having me, Chris. Absolutely. So I thought we could uh, start out, you know, if you would, by just giving us um, kind of a, a brief career sketch, how you came to be a CDO, which I understand is an, an enterprise role with American Express, were there a couple of pivotal roles or experiences, and then sort of a brief outline of the, the scope um, and accountabilities of, of your group? Yeah, sure, of course. So I have a bit of a unique pathway, I think, to the, to the chief data officer role. Um, I actually have an uh, undergraduate degree in, of all things, forestry, quantitative ecology, actually. Um, I wanted to make better decisions about the environment, so I went on and got a master's degree in statistics and environmental statistics. Um, I thought I'd be, you know, my, my role in the world would be to count birds in the forest. Um, that <laughs> did not happen. Um, my, uh, I had to stay put after graduating. My husband was finishing his own degree program in computer science um, and uh, got a job at a small subprime credit card company and really got in, very interested in all of the data and all of the, the, the challenges and all of the problems that could be solved with data in the financial services industry. And then I, uh, I, I actually went and you know, deliberately looked for a job at American Express because if I was gonna be in financial services, I wanted to work for the best. Yeah. And as a customer, I had had my best experiences at American Express. So I chose to find a job at American Express um, and I've been here for you know, quite some time now, but a couple of the pivotal roles um, at American Express that I've had um, that really, I think, prepared me for the CDO role was one, a, a role that I had in fraud risk management. Um, and that was a role that included all, all of the data and analytics and modeling skills that I learned as a statistician, but also um, helped me to learn about the technology side of the data and the data aspects of solving the, how those two things come together to solve problems. Um, because in fraud, if you don't catch it quickly, you don't catch it at all. Yep. So yep. it's not just about the data. It's about the systems and the delivery of those, those decisions, et cetera, in a very real time environment. So working in that space really got me my first real job in, you know, what turned out later to be software product management. Right. Um, but at the time was just, you know, we were thinking more of this project management in the early aughts when I, when I did that role. Um, and so I learned a ton there. The second role was um, when I started leading the digital acquisition space at American Express, and we went through um, agile delivery transformation. So in that space, we really needed to come together um, and cut across silos, bring teams together in order to deliver end to end in a scaled agile universe. Um, and through that experience, I learned a lot about change management, a lot about people as systems, um, and how to, how to really bring those things together to affect change across an organization um, and across organizational silos, which I think is really what the chief data officer role is a lot about, is cutting across those silos and making, and making a difference and making the changes. Um, and as far as my role as CDO um, and what my what, what it entails at American Express, um, you know the, the the vision that I have is to realize the potential of our our unique data assets to power the world's best customer experience, right? Which goes right along with our vision of customer experience as a company. And I'm in that role. I'm I'm accountable for consistent, usable, and trusted data. Um, across the enterprise, which includes the data management aspect of that role and doubling down on our successful use of data in the company over many, many years now in the areas of marketing, risk, and servicing, and ensuring the company, you know, ensuring that the company uses data in a way that uh, 
it really brings the trust of our customers as a, as a key aspect and, and ensures that we are complying with all the changing regulatory landscape um, in the, around the world these days. So that's really the, the function of the role. That's, that's just really interesting and um, uh, interesting about your background, too. I, I, uh, I, I have an undergraduate degree in philosophy and ended up, you know, doing all this digital and technology stuff. So it just goes to show, you know, wherever you start, there's a, a, lot, of, a lot of pull towards all this interesting work. I really um, appreciate your observation, too, how much of, uh, you know, digital data transformation roles are about change management within an organization. And then... Um, you know, very interesting what you're doing with data, obviously, um, you know, kind of a tremendous heritage and, and being kind of an early adopter from an American Express standpoint of, of managing all that customer data, which I think will be a great, uh, great opportunity to explore in, in our conversation. So maybe we can kind of double click on, um, on the, the customer piece of this for, uh, for a few minutes. Um, when I was thinking about American Express, you know, there's an argument to me to be made that American Express maybe was like the original platform company before there was such thing as, as such a thing as a technology platform company. Um, you know, I see that one of your key strategic pillars is uh, quote making American Express an essential part of our customers' digital lives. So, just kind of tying back to you know. Um, world-class customers, customer experience. Who do you think about as being your customers and kind of how does that inform the strategy? Yeah, so we have a very broad base of customers, right? Our customers go from consumers to merchants to small businesses to very large multinational corporations. Yeah. Um, and so across that different, you know, customer universe, it's really important for us to bring all that data together in a way that helps um, solve customer problems, right? And one of the ways that we do that is through something we call Customer 360. So, so that, that capability, yeah, go ahead, Chris. No, man, maybe I can just drill into that. So I've often felt like in thinking about the digital space and the, the data space that, that business to consumer is kind of the easiest model for people to understand. And sometimes companies trying to do data work and digital transformation try to paint the whole world with that brush of, of B2C. In fact, you're in a unique position as you articulate that you've got kind of three very different you know, channels or, or major segments. So maybe amplify a bit you know, some of the, the differences in the strategy from a, a customer experience standpoint and then how those are brought to life um, with your, your data assets. Yeah, that's a great question. So I think that, you know, going back to the, the, the customer 360 capability, I think it highlights what you're, what you're asking very well, which is that we have one single, um, uh, uh, you know, capability that brings all of our data together across all of our different lines of business um, in order to create a, a complete view of the customer relationships that we have. And by doing that, we're actually then able to reuse that capability across all, all sorts of different experiences. So let me give you a few examples. Yeah. One is that we have, uh, you know, if, if we have a sales experience um, in our corporate or our small business environment in which we know we have a consumer relationship with that person, we are able to bring all that data to bear in that sales experience and customize that experience. Um, for that relationship we have with them. Uh, we also have, you know, the other, the other aspect, which is we, we understand whether or not a merchant um, has, you know, a corporate card relationship with us or they do not. And we can then customize that experience based on that knowledge and that understanding of how, you know, how much business are we doing with this customer and how, um, how deep is our relationship with them. I think that that make, can make a huge difference in the way that we interact with each of them. So that so if I if I understand your your point correctly, and this is very interesting. So in, in a sense, you could think about there's one there's one uh, sort of view that the the channels and the segments are rather different. But part of the magic is that because you're actually interacting, if you look at it from kind of the customer experience out rather than the segment in, you can bring to bear different facets of the data, you know, from an, an end customer standpoint, merchant standpoint, at, in order to 
uh, you know, provide the best possible experience. So that's really, that's interesting. And I think it speaks to some of the, you know, the, both the unique characteristics and unique assets um, that you have as a, as a company, if, if I'm following correctly. Yes, absolutely. So, so in, in that vein, so the very interesting, like chief data officer, right? So I think about my, and I have actually had um, all three of those experiences with with Amex as a, a you know a, a large corporate customer as a, an SMB and then as an individual consumer and one of the things they're like they're like three companies in the world I'm exaggerating that still have like real customer service so old fashioned traditional customer service if I have a problem I can call up and speak to a human um, for which I I would say thank you I love that about American Express but it's it's in a sense, um, it's it's almost like a non-traditional approach now because the trend has been to just outsource and outsource and kind of push customer service back onto the customer rather than viewing it as kind of an asset or a capability that's strategically valuable. So in that, you know, sort of data realm, the intersecting segments that we talked about, and then the idea of of, of you know traditional customer service, what's you know, what's the interlock? What's the benefit of maintaining both of those and that kind of idea of your, your customers' digital lives? Yeah, so uh, we don't, we see them as complementary to each other, right? So versus, you know, being a, a, a trade-off. Um, so what we try to do is we build digital experiences that are, you know, based on data like customer 360 that help, you know, give the right experience to the right person at the right point in time based on the data the machine learning and the design of the experience all working together in concert. Um, and then when necessary, we can direct people when touch points are challenging to reach out to a customer service representative to, to get the type of experience they are expecting in that, in that particular interaction. So we see these as all very complementary channels to each other in delivering the best customer experience. So I agree conceptually, but you know, in, in my work, I deal with a lot of customers that are kind of chasing cost optimization. And I think that there's a, a view that it's sort of a, a, you're saying it's a positive sum game. I think most companies see it as at best a zero sum game and possibly a negative sum game. It, has there ever been any any pressure to, you know, sort of it's like, well, we have this, it's expensive, you know, it's valuable, but maybe it's too expensive. Let's let's push more and more to automation. Or is this something that you would sort of view as in a way like a like a crown jewel of your uh, market position and 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 differentiation? Like what, what do you know that what do you know that your competitors don't know who are all doing this? And to me, what's kind of a you know, it's a it's a bad way from a customer standpoint. I think that we have always put the customer experience first, right? That's something that is inherent in our brand. It's inherent in who we are as a company. So I think that by taking that, you know, customer first perspective, like you saw with customer 360 and seeing the relationships across and by seeing the interactions across all channels and understanding what is the best channel to do what interaction in um, for the customer experience. And of course we have automation goals like any other company, yeah, yeah. but we want to use those in the service of, you know, balanced outcomes that we want great outcomes for our customers. Um, we want to retain JD power. We want to do those great things, but we also want to, to, you know, be, you know, great for our shareholders as well. So we have both of those, we have those balancing aspects of how we make decisions in American Express. Yeah, no, no, that makes sense. So it's sort of, you know, one is that, and, and just on a personal level, I agree, there's part of the human touch that just can't be replaced when you really need it. But then there's also, I think, from a, a data and data science standpoint, if, if I follow your line of, of thinking, you know, in the same way that the best chess player in the world isn't a human and isn't a machine, it's a human guided by a machine, you know, that's maybe a, a good analogy for your philosophy of customer service that, you know, all that automation and the 360 degree data and the machine learning fraud prediction, pr prediction, but at the end of the day, you want to actually have some, you know, the human touch and human intention kind of guiding that customer experience so that it really um, is, isn't just, you know, purely automated. 
Yeah, yeah. I think a great example of that is our is our messaging in within our American Express app. So there is there is when you go in there and and you know ask us a question. Um, of course, there's automation and there's AI in there, but there's also you know very good intelligence around you know once you get to a point where the AI can no longer serve you, it goes seamlessly to a customer service professional. Right. What's the, you know, if you're you're able to share without getting, you know, too far into proprietary stuff, how, well, maybe I'll ask the question this way, how have you designed the system to sort of know what the tipping point is? Like when it's, you know, when, the, when automation's not working, because on the customer experience side, like you can tell, if you're, if you're the customer of that, you can tell instantly and it becomes exasperating very quickly, right? So you must have done something smart to kind of design that customer experience system to, to try to identify, you know, sort of trigger points or tipping points, which is, it's an interesting balance, I think, of, you know, data work, AI technology work, and then, you know, kind of change management and, and business philosophy. Yeah, it, 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 it is a, bringing all of those disciplines together, right, is, is the key. Right, understanding when the decision science, like when that, when when is that, when it, where is that going to work, and doing the analytics around where that's going to work, and then where it's not going to work, and then designing the systems around the data-driven analytics, I think, is a key to the success of, of the things that we've done. Yeah, 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 makes sense. Well, you 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 kind of answered this already, but but maybe just to, to sort of put a punctuation mark, if if you if you were to characterize uh you know for for the audience, is your role kind of more about growth and differentiation or more about efficiency and optimization and cost savings? Or what's the balance that you strike in terms of you know managing those data assets and kind of figuring out how that uh, how you contribute to driving the, the strategy? I don't think they are mutually exclusive, right? I think they're all of the above. Um, but I think that you, there are ways in which you can drive efficiency through innovation um, and vice versa. So I, I, my role is, is all of these different things, is, is realizing the potential of the data assets. Um, whether that be for efficiency or whether that be for innovation, very much a matter of the use case, right, in the scenario. So, so I think that we, you know, are attempting to, to, to drive both outcomes. Yeah, well, I, I, no, of course, and I wasn't, I didn't mean to suggest that they were, um, that they were, you know, sort of binary opposites, but maybe just to, to drill into that a little bit. I mean, when you were speaking about your background, I kind of, you know, I have the, the, impression that your role is kind of a, a combination of, you know, senior level product management, right? But then also business strategy. So are there are there a couple of, um, you know, areas in which you've used data assets to drive growth or to drive differentiation, maybe outside the immediate um, customer experience area that, that you could share? But, and the reason I'm asking this is because I, I, I sometimes feel like the, um, the whole AI data asset world is overly focused on cost optimization at the expense of growth. So I, I, I agree with you philosophically. I don't think there's necessarily a trade-off, but I'm always very interested in where um, companies other than pure play data companies are using their data assets to drive growth or to drive differentiation. Yeah, I think that, you know, it's, it's hard to pinpoint any specific because it's actually part of the DNA. Mm -hmm. Right. So did the, the data science underpins so much of our products in so many different ways. So let me give you an example of, you know, the, you know, one of the aspects that we do is experimental design. Right. So we actually within our digital products. So we will consistently be testing and learning on the digital products to understand what created the most seamless and easy experience for a particular consumer. And by doing that work, and it's, it's literally in the day-to-day -day work of the digital products that we have. So it gives you a sense of how, I think the combination, the power of what we put together is a combination of the digital assets and the data and power using them together to power the experience. Yeah, yeah, no, that, 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 that makes sense, thank you. Um, 
so maybe maybe shifting gears a little bit um let's let's go into uh sort of data ethics ai ethics and 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 regulatory for a bit um you know can you share at a macro level how how important is the regulatory landscape either kind of backward looking or forward looking uh, in in shaping and driving the direction of the the data market yeah, I mean, I mean, as a you know, as a financial services institution that is you know highly regulated, um, the you know, the regulators are you know a key constituent of our of mine as the CDO, as well as you know the consumers, right? So and our all of our all of our customers. So I see those I see the regulators as a as a key constituent, um, and a and we are you know consistently looking at all the regulation around the world and making sure that our products are. And our experiences and our data assets are complying with those with those regulations around the world. So it's key to us, and it does drive a lot of the um, the aspects of how we go about um, managing our data assets. Um, but I think that that is, you know, clearly in many cases in line with what our customers expect of us, right? Which gets to your point around ethics, yeah. right? So. I think that you know we, we are working right now on on really putting together internally a set of data ethics that will you know cascade across the enterprise so that we're all very clear as an organization around the ethical principles and having our customers backs as well as meeting the regulatory expectations. Yeah. Yeah, no, that that's you know very interesting. And I and I guess to just drill into that a little bit, I'm wondering um, you know the my my view is that to some extent the pace of technology change has been so rapid over the past 10 years in particular that it's extremely difficult for the regulators to keep up so if you look at an issue which I, i'm sure um you know is is top of mind and you I'm, I'm sure you have some good thinking about on on for example algorithmic bias right algorithmic bias um you know for those in the the audience who aren't familiar with this in particular in machine learning is it can be sensitive to what data um, the models are trained on. So when you're dealing with individuals' data, you have to be very careful that you know economic bias or demographic bias doesn't creep into the predictive models. Uh, I my sense is that the regulatory community hasn't caught up with that yet, and so I'm wondering if you think that you know um, market leading companies like American Express have kind of a role to play. Not just obviously in following the regulations, but in providing thought leadership to regulators to kind of help make sure that um, they don't fall too far behind the fantastic, you know, exponential pace of technology change that we have been experiencing and, and will continue to experience. Yeah, I mean, I, I do think we have a role to play, right, in in you know educating and in influencing policymakers, et cetera, on on these particular areas. Um, and I do think that we are we are current, as far as algorithmic bias, like the company, we are definitely working on 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 that at the moment, um, and we will continue to do so. It's part of our values, right, yeah. as a company, to have our customers back and to do the right thing. Um, these are just part of, of Amex, and so we want to make sure that we are making decisions that are as unbiased as they can possibly be, um, and that is part of of what we're going to be working on as part of our data ethics program. Yeah, no, that that's why wow, that's that's great to hear. And and I, you know, I wonder if you, again, this is just my point of view. I, I have um, sort of an emerging view that there are a couple of industries that have kind of a special role to play in helping to advance that um, regulatory agenda in a way that is is thoughtful. So not crippling growth, but you know, not sort of letting. Um, making sure that that consumers and businesses are protected. One is I have a life sciences background, so I tend to think of you know medical data, PII medical data is playing a special role. But I, I kind of see the same thing in in financial services that because of the you know the the privacy and and you know how critical that data is to the lives of of humans, that the your industry has kind of a you know a, a marquee role to play and a leadership seat at the table in terms of kind of advancing that, that regulatory agenda in a, in a balanced way. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we feel that our, our customers have, have 
chosen to trust us with our data um, and to protect it. And it's an important aspect of how we think about our data. Yeah, yeah, super. Another, shifting gears again, uh, another area that I'm very interested in and, and you know, value your perspective on is, you know, one of the top issues that I, I hear about in the industry, in particular from chief data officers, chief digital officers, and, and CIOs is around talent. What's your sense of kind of the talent pipeline? You know, are we on track? And you can sort of think about this from maybe a North America perspective and also a global perspective. You know, is the pipeline soft? Are we in trouble in terms of um, meeting demand? And then secondarily, you know, there's there's historically been a you know a significant um, issue with diversity in you know kind of technical and, and data in particular. Are we getting better at that um, over time? I mean, first of all, I think that the talent issue is, I mean, pretty obvious, right? Like, it's I think we definitely have a uh, a talent um, challenge within the areas of data, right? Um, and whether or not you just think about that as the population of, of individuals who are choosing to go into these fields, or you choose, or you want to look at it from the diversity angle. Either way, we have a challenge. Yeah. Um, and I think that it's becoming increasingly more challenging with the fact that disciplines are getting more and more individualized right more specialized in nature so like when we think about like even within my own organization we have like you know machine learning you know experts ai experts right we also have you know we also have you know the, the experimental design all of these things came from very similar mathematical statistical backgrounds but they've all become disciplines in their own right so i think the combination of of you know the specialization of these different data disciplines and there's just the number of people who are going into them and the diverse what type of backgrounds those people are coming from is definitely creating more of a talent crisis um, and I think that that's something that you know we and the and the universities need to start working on and I, I appreciate all the STEM work in lower levels and lower grades that's going on around around the country and around the world to encourage. Um, you know, uh, you know, women and minorities and STEM. Um, and I do think that that will make a difference in the longer term, but in the short term, it's definitely a challenge. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I think that a couple of really important observations just to start with the last one. I mean, I, I agree. And in fact, this seems obvious, you know, if we can, if we can improve diversity throughout the pipeline from early education, and that's going to help to some extent alleviate, but it's kind of a long-term game. And unfortunately, you know, my observation is we've still got a ways to go in terms of the uh, sort of winnowing out of diversity as you get to senior levels, which is, you know, a, a chronic issue that's been, been talked about a lot. Um, I think your other observation is spot on, too, is that, you know, at like uh, consequent or attendant to exponential growth in technologies, there's been a, a trend towards hyper-specialization. And this has actually, in my view, occurred kind of throughout, you know, if you will, the, the technology offices, regardless of how you construct those. But then because of the demand, uh, you know, it, it in a way is perhaps even more acute in the data fields, which are almost just emerging, you know, like in the last 10 years as kind of a thing, as opposed to, you know, like, like a, a more traditional programmer. Um, do, do you, I know this is not, a, you know, a, a, an, an easy question, but, you know, beyond what's being done, you know, as you discussed in sort of, you know, early secondary education, are there, there are obvious things we can do as, you know, as um, data leaders and data professionals um, to kind of help with this? Is, is there anything we could be doing for mid-career people who are sort of seeing the magic of this and maybe pulling them over? Um, and, you know, interestingly, like as I, I shared with you, I didn't originally have a technical background at all. I, I came actually into digital and technology from almost purely a business track and then sort of learned on the job over time. So, um, you know, there is hope for people, but I wonder if just from a, you know, human capital management, um, there's more we could be doing kind of along the lines of drawing in perhaps non-traditional sources of, of talent to alleviate what is to your point, a pretty obvious pipeline shortage that, that's coming in, in, you know, in the future. Yeah, I'm, I, there, that's a very interesting thought. I don't know that I ever thought about like bringing people over, you know, mid-career, right, um, into, but I think that's a very interesting idea. Um, I think that the, 
the things that I've tried to do is more just be, you know, a representative of, of women in data, women in technology, women in, in digital. Um, and, you know, been part of different groups, both internally and Amex and externally, um, whether it be women in product or other things to, to, to make it clear that there are, there are women in these fields um, and show other women that it, it, it's, it's possible, right? Like I think, you know, if people see it, then they can do it, but if they don't see it, it feels impossible. Uh, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And, and and so, you know, hopefully over time, we'll, we'll be able to reduce kind of negative self-selection by having good role models. And, you know, that's very much the hope. So I, I think that's, uh, I think that's terrific. Maybe just to, uh, to wrap up any, um, can I, can I put you on the hook for any major predictions on say a five to 10 year horizon for uh, data science and analytics, either in financial services or in, in business and society at, at large? Well, I think that, you know, there's the obvious one that is probably not a prediction that pretty much everyone in the field is, you know, thought is like, you know, there's just gonna, there's going to be more AI, right? There's, there's just, this is going to become more a part of the bedrock of, of the technology that, you know, everyone is using. It already is. And I just think it's just going to become more. Um, and I think that with that brings more interesting questions about data ethics, right? So I think I consider, I can, I see that those things are going to continue to evolve. I also think that the, you know, we talked about specialization. I think there's probably going to be continued deeper specialization, whether it be in, you know, data governance, data management, um, you know, machine learning, you know, it's at least the, you know, experimentation. I think there's going to be continued specialization in the area of data. Um, so if there are any folks out there that are looking for a career change okay. and listening to this, you know, <laughs> you know, like for our conversation earlier, um, data is a great place to be. It's a great, it's a great place to be. Let me, you know, just it, it occurred to me when you were when you were answering, maybe to come back full circle. One of the things I, I love about this conversation, Danielle, is that we got into this sort of you know, the central model and kind of the human touch. Is, is that something, you know, if we look five, 10 years out as data leaders, we should be thinking about like ubiquitous AI, you know, just from a, a science and technology standpoint is fascinating. On the other hand, I think that we can see the potential for it to, for, uh, you know, businesses and society and tech companies to get carried away with it. Um, so, you know, I, I wonder if, you know, we would collectively take a position to say, look, you know, look, here's one of the, the best companies, the best brands in the world. And a core part of their philosophy, you know, from the, the leadership down is that, yes, all the automation, all the technology, but don't lose the human touch. And I wonder if that's something that, um, you know, as leaders, we can encourage in our, our fellow AI and, and data scientists, you know, as we move forward into a future where, to your point, there's just gonna be more and more AI infused into everything that we do. Yeah, I think we have to always remember, right, that we're, we're this this is in the service of human beings. Yes. Right, not, not in the service of the technology itself. Um, and I think it's easy to get lost in that, in the interesting problems that you can solve, but if it doesn't solve a human problem, then it probably doesn't need to exist, right? Yes, I completely, I completely agree. Thank you for that, and um, I think that's a that's a, a inspirational and a, a terrific uh, point for us to wrap up today. Um, thank you so much for for joining me, Danielle. Um, I, a terrific conversation. I, I enjoyed it very much. Yeah, thanks, Chris. Yeah, and and for our audience, we've got um, some additional interviews at cdomagazine.tech. And uh, again, thanks so much, uh, Danielle, and thanks uh, to the audience for joining us today.